I swear, man, it's totally crazy when you're just an ordinary student and then boom, you become these super talented students with all sorts of skills. Then you have to participate in a killing game, investigate murders together, and convict the culprits in class trials. That's what happens in the Danganronpa series. But Danganronpa V3 is a separate event from the entire series timeline, and it has a very unique writing style that I'll analyze right now. It starts with our main character, Kanade, shocked as she steps out of a locker in an unfamiliar classroom. Not long after, a boy her age, Shuichi Saihara, also falls out of a locker next to her. They discuss how they were kidnapped by a black-clad culprit like in Detective Conan, and then they step out of the classroom. They are greeted by a giant, blazing robot controlled by a cartoonish voice. The two run all the way to the gym, where we get a glimpse of the other students in this mysterious school. They are ordinary students from different schools, looking very panicked about the current situation. Then the mysterious robots appear again. This time, there are five of them. And from these five robots, five bears appear, calling themselves the Monocubs Gang. Monotaro, Monosuke, Monofani, Monodam, and Monokid. These bears are shocked and blame each other for forgetting to prepare the students' talents to start the game. Then, they transform the students to look like the Ultimates and shine a flashlight like Doraemon's magic gadget. Once again, we return to the opening scene, but this time, Kade remembers her talent, but not the recent events, raising quite a few questions like, why are the students given talents, and why do the bears treat them like actors? Shuichi once again falls out of the locker. The bears appear and declare that this is an academy for super talented students. They suggest everyone introduce themselves and then participate in some small activities. From here, we not only explore the school but also discover the talents of different students. Shuichi Saihara, the ultimate detective, has a shy personality and an emo hat boy vibe. He was given this title after accidentally solving a case he stumbled upon. Our main character, Keide Akamatsu, the ultimate pianist, remembers and recounts how she has been playing the piano since she was a child, quickly falling in love with it and winning many awards that led to her title. In the hall, we meet the other characters. First is Tsumugi Shirogane, the ultimate cosplayer, a rather absent-minded girl who is only interested in talking about fiction and animanga. Next is Rantaro Amami, the ultimate Tom, who seems more aware of his current situation than everyone else, despite forgetting his talent. Then there's Tenko Chabashira, the ultimate Aikido master, a martial arts-loving girl who is quite goofy. She seems to reject men and leans towards women, especially cute and weak girls, with her main target being Himiko Yumeno, the ultimate magician. Although Himiko claims to be a true magician, she dodges when asked to perform, and often explains unexplainable events by saying it's her magic. In the storage room we meet Miyu Iruma, the ultimate inventor, who has a rather perverted personality and a masochistic streak. She reluctantly obeys those who are firm with her. In the library, we meet the best girl, Maki Harukawa, the ultimate child caregiver. She has a personality similar to Kirigiri, but is quite poor at communicating with others, and is the type who is cold on the outside but warm on the inside. Next is Ryoma Hoshi, the ultimate tennis pro. Despite his childlike appearance, he has a deep, warm voice that's even more mature than my dad's. He's a disillusioned young man who used his tennis skills to kill another man, making him a criminal, something he is always ashamed of. In a random classroom, we first meet Keibo, the ultimate robot. He's quite sociable and always wants to understand and behave like a normal human student. He has a strong disdain for people with irrational fears of robots. The second person is none other than the smartest and most well-written character in the entire series, Kokichi Oma, the ultimate supreme leader. He's a mischievous boy who claims to be the leader of an evil organization and is known for his ability to lie without batting an eye. Korekio Shinguji, the ultimate anthropologist, stands out with his mask covering his lower face. He has a voice and personality like a snake, and no one knows if it's venomous or not. Stepping outside to meet the remaining characters, we soon realize the entire school campus is covered by a giant iron birdcage, symbolizing the suppression of human freedom. Next is Kaido Momoda, the ultimate astronaut. He's straightforward, hot-tempered, and always stands for justice. He's the kind of guy who will smile encouragingly in any situation and never give up, even if he can't do much to help. Speaking of being a bit dumb, we have Gonta Gokuhara, the ultimate entomologist. Despite his massive and intimidating appearance, Gonta has the personality of a child who loves bugs and always tries to help others with his gentlemanly soul. Angie Yonaga, the ultimate artist, talks more about her god Aura than her love for drawing. In short, she's a devout follower. Finally, at the dormitory, we meet Kirumi Tojo, the ultimate maid. She is a capable and resourceful person who can handle almost any task and is quite intelligent. With the character introductions complete, all the ultimate high school students are summoned to the gym once and for all. They are greeted by robots called Exitslas, and everyone panics again, as if seeing these robots for the first time. However, Rontaro, who is the most aware of the situation, pressures the bears to reveal their purpose. 
This leads to the bear siblings arguing over who will explain first, until only one bear can end the chaos, none other than the super VIP Monokuma. The school killing game begins here. If any student wants to graduate, there are absolute rules to follow. A student must commit their act flawlessly and cover it up to avoid being exposed in the class trials. If successful, that student will graduate, and all remaining students will be punished in the truest sense. The panic of the situation blinds all the students, and they must find a way to escape this bizarre school. Following a hint, the group heads to the hangar, where they find a manhole cover and think it might be their way out. However, even the robot Kibo can't lift the cover. But Ganta shows his strength by easily breaking the cover with one hand. Bro is the strongest. In the basement, there's an escape route, but to get through, the group has to play a game like a troll meme version of Mario, designed to be unwinnable. But if you save the game and play until you know all the traps, you can reach the exit. Just as hope begins to shine, Monokuma appears and shows Keide the real world outside, filled with nothing but despair. She has to return with heavy disappointment. As I mentioned, the story is designed so you can't win the game. After two attempts, Keide still wants to try again, but hope has faded from everyone's faces. Kokichi realizes that escaping is just a trick by Monokuma and refuses to continue, stating the obvious truth that it's pointless. Monokuma appears just to laugh at the naive students who think they can escape. The group, exhausted, scared, and discontented, retreats to their rooms. The next morning, Kokichi, quick to change his tune, blames everyone for the discomfort, targeting Keide, despite her best efforts to help the group escape. Even though Kokichi was the one who stirred up discontent in the first place, it's clear he wants the group to unite and address the immediate issues. Memory loss, being in a school with 16 strangers, and the bizarre bears claiming to be the headmasters, organizing a killing game. They even have advanced robots to prevent any resistance. Before they can investigate further, Monokuma appears and gives the students motives for the first murder to occur, called the first blood perk. If a student dares to commit a murder and confesses, they will graduate and leave the school immediately without a class trial. The remaining students will stay until at least two are left. Of course, none of the students are willing to kill their newly met friends, and Kaido even tries to take on the bear one-on-one. -on -one. Then the Monocubs appear to protect their dad, only to accidentally crush Monokuma with an exocell. Everyone rejoices, thinking that with Monokuma gone, they don't have to continue this ridiculous game. How naive, because this is Danganronpa, and the story can't end that quickly. The next day, high school detective Shuichi discovers a secret door in the library. Shuichi theorizes that there must be a mastermind controlling Monokuma and the entire academy, possibly one of the 16 students. This secret door is designed in Monokuma's colors and has a card reader, so not just anyone can enter. To check if the mastermind is still alive and using this room, Shuichi discreetly places some dust on the card reader and memorizes its structure before they leave. The following day, Monokuma returns to announce another condition to hasten the start of the killing game, a time limit. If no murder occurs within the next two days, all students will face a common fate. This sends the students into a frenzy of panic and suspicion among their new friends. Leading this chaos is Kokichi, who decides to separate from the group and act alone, allowing Keide to continue her friendship-driven fight until the end. Shuichi quickly takes Keide to check the secret door in the library and finds that the dust on the card reader has been disturbed, meaning there really is a mastermind behind everything, and this room is related to Monokuma's resurrection. The next day, our detective Shuichi comes up with an idea to expose the mastermind by setting up motion-detecting cameras. The cameras and motion sensors can be found in the warehouse, but to connect and control them, they need some fine-tuning from the ultimate inventor, Miu Iruma. Naturally, she initially refuses, but with enough pleading to make her embarrassed, convincing her isn't too difficult. So Kaide and Shuichi kneel and beg, without revealing the true purpose of the cameras, to expose the mastermind. Next, the two head to the warehouse to find the cameras and sensors to bring to Miu's lab. Kaide discovers some heavy iron balls in a box, though it's unclear what she plans to do with them. They bring the equipment to Mew's lab. In the school, everyone has their own room to develop their talents, equipped with tools related to their skills. Some areas are still locked, but some students like Mew already have access to their research labs. The following day, while Shuichi goes to Mew to collect the finished products, Keide heads to the cafeteria after hearing about an incident involving Ryoma. The disillusioned Ryoma volunteers to be the victim, so others can commit a murder and escape, as he has lost all purpose in life. He believes the escapee could bring help from the outside to end this school. However, Rontaro argues that this is not something everyone can do, and hints that he has a plan to end this ridiculous game. Persuading Ryoma to change his mind. Reuniting with Shuichi, the two quickly set up cameras in areas that cover the entire view of who enters the library and who uses the secret room. They also notice an air vent large enough for a person to crawl through from the second floor down to the library on the first floor. Kaide volunteers to climb up and clear the books on the shelf to find a good spot for the camera and block the vent so no one can use it. 
She spends quite a bit of time cleaning up the books, while Shuichi looks up from below, chilling and living his best life. They set up the cameras to capture the main entrance, the side door, and the entire area to catch anyone using the secret door. Shuichi also disables the flash on all three cameras so the mastermind won't notice them. Then they head to the classroom upstairs to wait for the alarm from the control panel. While waiting, Keide realizes over the past few days working with Shuichi how amazing a detective he is, despite his insecurities. Shuichi doesn't consider himself a detective and is haunted by the case he solved, where the culprit sought revenge on the victim for causing his family's death. This fear of facing the truth makes Shuichi hesitant to use his talent. Keide doesn't hesitate to hold Shuichi's trembling hands to encourage him, showing that her hands are also shaking. She tells him that even in the most heartbreaking moments, they should face the truth. Shuichi is an incredible and trustworthy person to Keide, and he needs to be more confident in himself. Before the duo can share more, a loud, ear-piercing announcement blares from the school's TVs and speakers, warning that the deadline is approaching and urging the students to act immediately. A group of students determined to fight to the end, led by Kaito, along with Ganta, Maki, Tenko, Angie, Himiko, and Rantaro, head to the first floor to strategize against Monokuma. Shuichi follows the group to see what they're doing on the first floor, while Keide waits anxiously in the classroom on the second floor. After a while, Shuichi returns and the control panel starts vibrating, signaling that someone has used the library and triggered the sensors. Shuichi immediately rushes down to the first floor, with Keide following shortly after. They meet Kaito, who is looking for Rantaro and the others to gather for the strategy meeting. Shuichi suggests checking the library first as the mastermind might be there. Not fully understanding the situation, the four of them enter the library and see the secret door slowly closing. In the corner, they discover Rantaro Amami's body. Scene of discovering Amami's body. Naturally, the group is shocked and Tenko screams, causing the rest of the group, led by Kaido, to rush in. Keide convinces herself that Rantaro might be the mastermind, but then the announcement, a body has been discovered, is made. All the students gather shortly after the announcement, and Monokuma congratulates the student who dared to commit the murder, asking them to step forward to claim their reward as promised by the bear's motive. One minute passes, two minutes pass, five minutes pass, and no student steps forward. Monokuma laughs, confident that the culprit believes they can't be caught even if a class trial is held. So, the bear gives the group time to investigate the crime scene, providing them with a Monokuma file containing information about the victim, Rantaro Amami. The time of death is between 9 to 10 p.m., and the cause of death is a fatal head wound, with the murder weapon being the iron ball found near the body. Shuichi tells the group about the cameras, and Kirumi, with her maid skills, offers to develop the photos to find the culprit. However, the pink bear Monofani snatches the photos from Shuichi and offers to help the group, raising suspicions of covering for the culprit. The bear promises not to do anything shady and then disappears. With no other options, Keide quickly begins the investigation to expose the mastermind behind this case. From here, we can see that the secret door hasn't been used because the dust Shuichi set up is still there. Miu uses her drone invention to take pictures of the entire library to find clues. Shuichi is suspicious of Rontaro's death location, right near the camera setup, while Maki's testimony states that Rontaro went to the bathroom and Ganta was in the AV room during that time. When asked why he wasn't with everyone to have an alibi, Ganta says he wanted to look at bugs to gather courage against Monokuma. However, the AV room has a side door connected to the library's side door. When Shuichi checks, he finds this door is jammed and can't be fully opened, so Ganta's testimony can be trusted for now. Other testimonies include Korikyo saying he was in the dining hall with Miu, Kirumi, and Tsumugi, although Tsumugi went to the women's restroom for a while. Angie was with Tenko. Kibo admits he was alone in his room, and Kokichi claims he committed the murder, stating that asking for his alibi is pointless since he was acting alone and is a liar. Tsumugi, who went to the restroom for a while, is a suspect, but we know she can't disguise herself as real people and can only cosplay fictional characters. Finally, Monofani gives the students the processed photos, which only show everyone rushing into the library after the announcement. A few pictures of Shuichi taking down the cameras, and some showing Rantaro entering the library through the side door, opening the secret door and trying to disable the camera, preventing anyone from seeing who entered the library. With that, Monokuma announces the end of the investigation and takes the group to the Monokuma statue, which dramatically transitions and opens an elevator to take the group down to the class trial. In the elevator, Shuichi received final encouragement from Keide, urging him to face the truth, no matter how frightening it might be. In the class trial, we will try to answer three main questions for every mysterious case. Who done it? How done it? And why done it? First, Kokichi proactively questioned the creator of the camera, Miu Irumi, because she knew her product best. 
we can infer that Miu could easily create another remote to control the camera and commit murder without leaving any trace. Although the game does not explain Kokichi's actions, as someone who recognizes Kokichi's intelligence, I will explain anyway. With the limited information Kokichi, who operates alone, received, his reasoning is not without merit. However, Miu had an alibi during that time, as she was with Korikyo's group in the dining hall. At this point, everyone revisited the matter of Gonta being alone in the AV room, which had a side door leading directly to the library side door, though it was jammed. No problem, the group, specifically the smart maid Kirumi, hypothesized that by using the projector screen in the AV room, Gonta rolled it up into a long stick and poked it through the hole from the AV room to open the library side door. The motion sensor would not capture a photo if only the door was opened. This was confirmed as a fact. Gonta, with his muscles, threw the iron ball from the AV room into the library, killing Rantaro. We also have the feat of Gonta lifting the extremely heavy bronze lid with one hand, so the group leaned towards this investigation. However, there was a logical flaw, because, in the photo, we see Rantaro behind the secret door, which was open and completely shielded and protected Rantaro from any thrown object. So Gonta was considered innocent. Angie believed the culprit was behind that secret door, but Kide quickly refuted this saying the culprit couldn't have hidden there since there were no signs of the door being opened or the card reader being used. The culprit also couldn't have used the vent because Kade had blocked it with books and the stack showed no signs of being disturbed. At this point, Mew revealed an important secret. The camera had a 30 second delay before it could take a new picture and only Mew and Shuichi knew this. Since Mew had been proven innocent, Shuichi, who had been silent until now, became the prime suspect. Kade decided to lie to protect Shuichi, claiming she had the remote control. So Shuichi couldn't have entered the library without her, because the alarm would only go off if both were together. This surprised Shuichi, and Keide immediately realized he knew the truth and urged him to confidently speak his mind, as they had promised each other. Was Shuichi going to be a coward and break the promise? With no other options, they quickly answered the question, who done it? It was our protagonist, Keide Akamatsu. Shuichi had turned off all the camera flashes, but only one camera had its flash on, which only Keide could have done. Additionally, the photo of the book staircase taken by Mew's drone from above was another clue. So how did she do it? We have to go back to when Monokuma gave the students a time limit to trigger a murder. Shuichi had asked the culprit for help to expose the mastermind. They found the secret door, got Mew's help, went to the warehouse to find the camera and sensor, and the culprit found the weapon, a steel ball, and quickly hid it in their bag. As the time limit approached, they both went to the library to set up the camera. The culprit volunteered to climb up and check the vent arranging the books into a staircase and opening a book to create a ramp for the ball. The culprit set up the camera to capture the secret door and used tape to hide the flash function. Once everything was ready, the culprit and Shuichi waited until they saw the victim, led by Kaido, heading to the first floor. When the alarm from the remote control indicated someone had entered the library, Shuichi rushed down, leaving the culprit alone. Without hesitation, the culprit took out the steel ball and threw it down the vent. The noise from Monokuma's announcement was too loud for the victim to hear the ball rolling. When Rantaro opened the secret door, he noticed the camera because the flash was on. He quickly approached the camera to remove it, and by sheer luck, the steel ball successfully hit the victim's head. When the group discovered Rantaro's body, it was clear that the one who committed the crime was none other than the ultimate pianist, Keide Akamatsu. This was the final answer agreed upon by the students, and Monokuma confirmed it as correct. So let's tackle the final question. Why done it? Keide believed it was her responsibility to kill the mastermind for the sake of her friends. She tried her best during the class trial to expose the mastermind, but when she realized the mastermind wasn't Rantaro, both Keide and Shuichi were heartbroken. Shuichi had once again wrongly deduced that the mastermind was one of the 16 students and would use the secret room at the last minute to start the killing game. Keide believed his reasoning and trusted Shuichi until her last moments. Keide quickly took all the blame, saying it had nothing to do with Shuichi. She wanted Shuichi to be strong, to carry her wishes, live for her and everyone else, and find a way to end this killing game. Monokuma initiated the punishment time, and although some friends tried to stand up against the robots, Keide stopped them, accepting her punishment and asking them to live and fight against this injustice. And so, her punishment began.
Kaito, angry, punched Shuichi for doing nothing and letting those bears execute Keide. He punched Shuichi to make him realize his mistake, but also comforted him by suggesting they go to Keide's lab to find the remaining pieces of her memories and the things she liked when she was alive. Chapter 1 ended with Shuichi listening to the music Keide suggested and recalling every little memory with her, promising her that he would fight to the end to uncover the truth for everyone's sake. End of chapter 1. Chapter 1 introduces an interesting concept of changing the protagonist, with a time limit, blaring alarms, and the first blood perk being the most reasonable motive of all time. Even the protagonist committing a murder alerts us that Danganronpa V3 is a perfect blend of lies and truths, reality and illusion, which I will dissect piece by piece. This case might not be the best because it relies on certain factors, especially luck, but there are still many questions to be answered so I won't criticize it too much. The dynamics between Shuichi and Keide were well done. Now, let's move on to Chapter 2. Chapter 2. It begins with a scene of the funeral for the 16 students, with only Keide present, related to an event we haven't learned about yet. In the garden, Ganta quickly discovers a mysterious code that reads, Horse A. Shuichi is invited by Kaido to join everyone in the dining hall and make amends. Shuichi, now appearing without his hat, has abandoned his emo persona and is ready to face the truth head on. Kirumi, with her talent, serves everyone. Although they seem relaxed on the surface, the case and the class trial, along with Keide's death yesterday, have left them psychologically scarred. Ganta quickly shares his early morning discovery of the code, which the group has no idea about, and mentions seeing a bug too, though it was so small he's not sure if he imagined it. I think Ganta, the true gentleman, didn't mistake it. We'll see. Monokuma appears with the Monocubs, rewarding the group with four items to unlock different areas. We discover more research labs, starting with Himiko's, filled with iconic magic items, followed by Kirumi's, styled like European nobility. Upstairs, we find Ganta's lab, full of various bugs, and in a treasure chest, there's a flash lamp like Doraemon's gadget, which Angie takes to figure out its use. The third floor also has Ryoma's lab, a tennis court with modern training equipment, and another room whose purpose we don't yet know. At the red door, we find Maki's lab, which she guards and has no intention of letting anyone enter. Okay, that doesn't make her look suspicious at all, right? Outside, we discovered the pool building, where we can swim freely. Except, during nighttime when it's completely off-limits unless you want to be punished by the robots. Surprisingly, the pool has windows right next to the gym, and another window facing a different room. We also explored a recreational area that doesn't relate much to the main plot, Hotel Love, where you can use monocoins for various activities to understand the characters better, and the casino, where we see just how crazy Kaido can be. Bro used all the money he earned on a single game like an average gambler, not gonna lie. Thanks to Angie. The group learned that the flashlight found earlier is a flashback light, which helps students remember their erased memories, as Monokuma confessed. When the light was turned on, Shuichi regained memories of the ultimate hunt, an event where talents like the 16 students had to run from an unknown force. The next day, all students received a tablet containing a video, which was the second murder motive. This motive pushed the killing game by giving them a reason to commit murder to escape the school and return to their loved ones, whose lives were threatened by Monokuma. However, this time it seemed the students didn't receive their own motive videos, but rather shuffled ones. Shuichi held Kaido's video, which talked about his grandparents, who had an accident right after he left, and he needed to graduate to find out more. In the dining hall, the group had a lively discussion about the weird videos they received, with different opinions emerging. Kokichi wanted everyone to show their videos together to see who had the most important loved ones and might be driven to murder, to dissuade them. Some students argued that this would only make the killing game happen as Monokuma intended, knowing they needed to escape after watching the videos. Knowing Kokichi was acting alone, the group decided not to make a unified decision about what to do with the videos. I completely agree with Kokichi's decision. Why? Because if we follow the hypothesis, the bears swapped the motive videos among the students, making them unaware of their true motives. But in the shadows, they might have given one to two students their actual motive videos, triggering the murder motive. This would trick the group into thinking there's no reason to continue the killing game since they don't know who their loved ones are. From here, those one to two individuals wouldn't be dissuaded and would plan to graduate and escape the bizarre school to return to their loved ones. That's Monokuma's real goal and the bears. Although there's no evidence yet, this is what Kokichi deduced with his abstract logic. Therefore, Kokichi had his own plan to make everyone follow his way. 
The next day, Shuichi woke up exhausted after training with Kaito the previous day because Kaito wanted him to be stronger and carry Kaito's wishes. Kaito immediately woke him up, telling him to run now. Gonta was furious and looking for everyone for some reason, making Shuichi run out of the dorm at full speed. He met Ryoma, who managed to escape thanks to his small size and tennis skills, but Shuichi wasn't so lucky. After being knocked out by the muscular Gonta, Kokichi welcomed him and announced that Gonta would give a lecture on why everyone should love bugs. Along with some others like Tenko, Kibo, Angie, Himiko, Tsumugi, and Korekio, this was Kokichi's plan. He told Gonta that it seemed people didn't like bugs much and suggested having a meeting like this to make them understand, temporarily keeping them with Gonta. Kokichi would then go into each person's room to collect their motive videos and force everyone to watch them to see who had the strongest motive to kill. As well as something he needed to confirm that we haven't learned about yet. Not gonna lie, no one really found the bugs lovely at all. Kokichi was an hour late as promised, claiming it was because Kirumi talked to him for an hour before he could collect the motive videos to show the group. However, Shuichi, or rather Kibo, stopped him with a recording function, revealing Kokichi's plan to use Gonta. This made Gonta angry, realizing Kokichi didn't like bugs much either. The group managed to escape, leaving Kokichi to play with the bugs for a long time, probably until he loved bugs as much as Gonta. The next day, the group gathered in the gym early to enjoy Himiko's magic show, organized with Angie's help to lift everyone's spirits. Kibo, Kaito, and Kirumi also assisted backstage. The performance involved escaping from a water tank before piranhas dropped in, with Angie adding a one-minute countdown for extra drama. Everyone was worried for Himiko. She jumped in, the curtain closed, and the countdown began. Gonta climbed the stage to save Himiko, but time ran out, and the piranhas fell. When the curtain opened, they revealed Ryoma's lifeless body, devoured by the piranhas. As Himiko appeared, the announcement, a body has been discovered, played. Kokichi urged Gonta and Tenko to use Kibo's body to break the tank, and the investigation began. Monokuma File 2 revealed the cause of death was drowning, but the time of death was unknown. Climbing up to open the window curtain, Shuichi saw the gym window open with strange scratches on the frame. Inside the water tank, there was a strange glass panel, and Angie noted there were more piranhas than yesterday. Gonta claimed he saw nothing in the tank at the time. Near the stage stairs, there was a puddle and a rope. Checking the pool next to the gym, they found a float tied with a rope and a mysterious black cloth. Investigating Ryoma's room for his motive video, Shuichi found it missing, as well as from the victim's body. Kaido briefly thought showing each other's motive videos was the best idea, but when Shuichi mentioned it was Kokichi's original plan, Kaito did a 180, calling his idea stupid, revealing his dislike for Kokichi. In Himiko's lab, they found Kokichi's alibi with Kirumi for an hour and a half naked girl, explaining why Gonta couldn't bring Mew to the meeting due to her secret weapon. The lab also had a water tank like Himiko's performance and a small escape route, revealing Himiko's magic trick. In Ryoma's lab, they found a prison-like design, handcuffs Ryoma wore, a scratched water tank, and a window connecting to the pool, higher than the gym window. Finally, outside the tennis court, Shuichi noticed the tennis net was removed for some reason. They took Kirumi's statement that Ryoma was alive around 8 p.m. when he tried to escape Gonta, while Maki had no reliable alibi, claiming she was guarding her lab as she was now. This was when Monokuma announced the investigation was over. Time for the class trials. Kaido encouraged his sidekick Shuichi one last time, and they prepared to uncover the three questions in this case. First, we had to uncover Himiko's magic trick, which was quite simple thanks to a secret escape route in the water tank connected to the stairs. The stairs had a hidden passage that allowed Himiko to escape, change clothes, dry her hair, and reappear when the countdown ended. The group hypothesized that Himiko killed Ryoma and hid him in the stairs, waiting for the perfect moment to swap him out. It seemed plausible, but Gonta, who was on the stage at the time, didn't see anyone in the tank, so we couldn't conclude that Himiko was the culprit. So, where was Ryoma's body? The answer lay in the densely packed piranhas in the glass panel found in the tank. Ryoma's body had been in the piranha tank from the start, protected by the glass panel. The piranhas, squeezed into one side, appeared more crowded, creating the perfect cover for Ryoma's drowned body in the other compartment. The case became trickier when the group realized that preparing all this was impossible. Entering the gym during nighttime would trigger the alarm, and early morning preparations would be interrupted by Angie and Himiko, who were setting up for the show right after nighttime ended. According to Kirumi's testimony, Ryoma was last seen alive at 8 p.m., so he could have been killed between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m. before nighttime began. So, who did it? There were four suspects without reliable alibis. Miu, Kirumi, Kaito, and Maki. 
Kirumi admitted to checking the gym for a few minutes before 9 p.m. and had an alibi with Kokichi for an hour. According to Kokichi, Mi was outside with her secret weapon, avoiding Ganta's bug-loving meeting. This left Maki and Kaido. Kokichi suggested they debate why they weren't the culprits to see who was lying. He revealed that he held Ryoma's motive video, which belonged to... Shuichi realized it must be Maki's video since he had Kaito's video. That's right, Ryoma had Maki's video, and Maki had Ryoma's. Ryoma likely approached Maki to talk, but she kept it a secret. Her actions of guarding her research lab were suspicious. Why hide the ultimate child caregiver's lab unless Maki didn't want anyone to know her true talent? And Ryoma, who knew her secret, was eliminated? Kokichi wanted to corner Maki psychologically to expose her lies. If you're planning to expose a liar, then you have to corner them psychologically. Only then will they reveal their true self as a liar, hiding beneath a layer of deceit. As the group turned their suspicion towards Maki, just as Kokichi wanted, Kaito stood by Maki, showing the stark contrast between him and Kokichi. Rejecting Kokichi's logic, Kaito trusted his instincts and convinced Shuichi to trust Maki too. Feeling guilty, Maki finally revealed her secrets, achieving the same result Kokichi wanted, but in a way that likely won over the audience more. Do you prefer Kaito's approach or Kokichi's? Maki admitted to talking with Ryoma, who was alive until after 10 p.m. He asked to see his motive video, which Maki had, and she agreed. Ryoma then left while she continued guarding her lab. The students were skeptical, but Shuichi lied for the first time to test if the conspiracy theory could have allowed Ryoma to be killed during nighttime. It doesn't necessarily have to be before that time anymore. He admitted to working out with Kaido outside at night and overheard Maki talking to someone who he now believes was Ryoma. Kaido also agreed, sweating bullets, to protect Maki Roll's testimony. Now, let's get back to figuring out who could have done it during the night. This leads us to how someone could enter the gym without triggering the alarm. If they couldn't get in through the door, how about through the window? This would require meticulous preparation. You can't just throw Ryoma into the water tank or use some magic trick. We have evidence that Ryoma could have drowned in his lab, where he was also wearing handcuffs. From the lab window to the gym window, using a rope and tennis net, a perfect ropeway was created to move the body into the gym during the night. This also explains the scratches on the window bars from tying the rope. Additionally, the float connected to the rope suggests the culprit used this ropeway to perfectly throw Ryoma into the piranha tank. When asked if stepping on the window was against the rules, the golden bear Monosuke admitted it wasn't, confirming the culprit had asked Monosuke beforehand. The person who could prepare the ropeway and the glass partition between the piranhas and Ryoma was none other than Kurumi Tojo, the ultimate maid, who is quick, resourceful, and extremely intelligent. So how was it done? The culprit used Himiko's performance to commit the crime. Ryoma was already dead and in the piranha tank the whole time. When Angie pulled the curtain, the piranhas had already eaten the body, leaving only bones and handcuffs, making it look like Himiko's magic show was the culprit's doing. The truth is, the crime began last night at 8.55 p.m. First, the culprit climbed the stairs to separate the piranhas from the rest of the tank, explaining why the fish seemed more numerous the next day. Then they took a rope, opened the window, and tied it to the window frame, dropping it down to the pool room. At nighttime, past midnight, the culprit lured Ryoma to his lab, attacked him, and knocked him out. They handcuffed Ryoma to prevent resistance and left no marks on the culprit's body, then drowned him in the sink filled with water. Ryoma struggled in his final moments, explaining the scratches on the sink. Ryoma was dead, but the culprit's plan had just begun. They took a cable from the tennis net, threw it out the window to the pool. At the pool, where swimming is prohibited at night but entering is not, the culprit tied two ropes together, creating a ropeway to move the body. They took the rubber inner tube found at the pool and brought it back to Ryoma's lab. There, the culprit pulled the rope up, tightened it, and tied it to the other side of Ryoma's lab window, completing the ropeway. The transport method was the inner tube connected to the rope. However, the culprit made two fatal mistakes. First, when they and the victim sat on the inner tube and slid down the slope between the two windows, the culprit had to control the speed with their hands, causing a piece of fabric from their glove to fall into the pool. Although they succeeded in throwing Ryoma from the window into the piranha tank, untying the rope and climbing down from the window, the inner tube unfortunately broke and fell into the pool. This prevented the culprit from erasing these two pieces of evidence because the pool couldn't be used at night. The person who could do this was none other than the ultimate maid, Kirumi Tojo. So why did she do it? The answer might become clearer if we look at Kirumi's motive video, right? Surprisingly, Kirumi received her own motive video, meaning she had a different motive for committing the crime from the start. The monocubs claimed they shuffled the videos and Kirumi accidentally got hers. Okay, I swear. This is a lie. From the beginning, the bears intended for Kirumi to be the culprit in the second case. Kokichi, who suspected this, suggested everyone watch each other's motive videos. Initially, it was a suggestion, but later he used Ganta to force everyone to see who had the strongest motive to kill, who wanted to escape to meet their important person the most. 
that so the group could share and comfort each other. However, because the students rejected Kokichi's insight, Kirumi ended up being just a victim of those bears. Remember, there are 14 students in total. If Kirumi received her own motive video, another person was also chosen as a potential culprit, meaning they also received their own motive video. Keep this in mind to figure out who that person is later. Anyway, Kirumi revealed in her motive video that she is not only the ultimate maid, but also the secret prime minister of Japan, bearing the responsibility of serving millions of people. Therefore, she couldn't be stuck in this wretched school. She had to survive and escape because she had a great duty and responsibility to fulfill. With her talent, she knew she was the most suitable person for the job. She also mentioned that Ryoma, after hearing her story, volunteered to help her escape peacefully. Maki then shared that after giving the motive video to Ryoma, he wanted to use it to find the important person he was fighting to survive for, only to realize there was no one important left for him outside. At this point, everyone sympathized with Kirumi, willing to take the punishment for her because she had a noble purpose. She cried and begged to live. Seeing everyone easily willing to give up their lives, Kaito stated that every life has value, and no one should underestimate themselves like that. Kirumi, too, fought to the end for the value of her own life. Kaito forgave her. At this moment, Kokichi interrupted, giggling because he saw Kirumi trembling before Kaito's awakening words. It turned out Kokichi had seen through Kirumi's deceitful facade. She had been trying to survive to the end, even if it meant deceiving her naive friends to sacrifice themselves for her. Moreover, do you think Ryoma would calmly let Kirumi kill him? I don't think so. If that were the case, she wouldn't have needed to tie his hands when drowning him. And the scratches on the sink prove Ryoma resisted until his last breath against Kirumi. He hadn't given up on life after spending time with Shuichi and the others. Finally, unable to deceive everyone anymore, Kirumi tried to escape. Everyone encouraged her, saying, Run, Kirumi, run! Except for Kokichi, who knew what was about to happen. Monokuma announced, It's punishment time! Everyone quickly mourned Kirumi's death, realizing she was also a victim of the motive video. On the way back, Kokichi decided to address one last question, the liar worse than himself, Maki. She didn't voluntarily give the video after just hearing a few words from Ryoma. Yes, you guessed it right, another liar. Ryoma had blackmailed her because he knew the true talent she was hiding, hitting her right in the heart. Maki disappeared, then suddenly rushed to strangle and lift Kokichi off the ground. Kokichi, observing her movements and demeanor, revealed her talent. Hey, are you going to kill me in front of everyone like this? That's not your style. You prefer killing in the shadows, don't you? Miss the ultimate assassin. End of chapter 2. Kokichi, a character who initially seems like a villain, actually operates based on keen observation and non-linear logical thinking. He's one of the most intellectually impressive characters in the series so far. This case features a very smart culprit who cleverly steered the conversation to make it seem like the crime happened before nighttime. They spent an hour with Kokichi to establish an alibi, used Himiko to frame the innocent girl, and, and didn't hesitate to lie and act to ensure their return. In the end, Kirumi was just a victim of the twisted school and its messed up game, making this case truly peak Danganronpa. Chapter 3. It starts with a news bulletin about a meteor destroying Earth, but no further details are given. We find ourselves in Maki's lab, filled with weapons suitable for an assassin. Monokuma and the Monocubs appear, with Monodam now leading, because he believes everyone can live in harmony. Monokuma temporarily retires. We receive items to unlock new areas on the fourth floor, which has a creepy vibe. There are a few empty rooms, Angie's research lab filled with paints and wax, and a room with two doors but only one lockable from both sides. Monodom eats the key to prevent anyone from using it for a crime, hinting at a potential locked room mystery. 
On the same floor, we find Karekio's lab, filled with various artifacts, including a gold-painted sword from a previous game and a Chinese necromancy book. Outside, we unlock Tenko's lab, where she demonstrates her Aikido skills by throwing Shuichi and Himiko. We also witness a secret meeting between Mew and Kibo, where Mew seems to be upgrading Kibo. We shouldn't disturb them. Back on the fourth floor, Monokuma leads us to a mirror that reveals a secret path to a high-tech computer room resembling Kibo's lab. The Red Bear claims this room can create a new world, but that's all we know. Importantly, we find another flashback light. Kokichi suggests everyone gather in the dining hall to recover more memories. Kaido drags Maki there, but everyone is still scared of her because of her ability to kill them all. This is why she hates her talent and wants to hide it. Ignoring Kaito, she returns to her room. Unable to stop Maki, the group uses the second flashback light, revealing that the previous funeral was for the 16 of them. The group starts discussing the spiritual theme of this chapter, thinking they might be in the afterlife. Some practical-minded people suggest there must be a reason behind the funeral. At night, Angie's actions to share her faith become more evident, helping everyone cope. Angie believes they are closer to the divine in the afterlife and that the god Auta will protect her. She hears his voice more clearly than ever. She's gone full cultist. During training, Kaido convinces Maki to join. Maki thinks it's pointless to refuse, since Kaido is so stubborn, so she decides to go along to avoid being bothered. Kaido continues to encourage and trust her. The three of them do push-ups together, but Maki finishes quickly and returns to her room. Not leaving Maki alone, the next day Kaido and Shuichi invite her to the gym. The Monocubs talk about the next motive, which involves a spiritual book that can resurrect one of the four deceased students. The resurrected student will be considered a transfer student and part of the killing game. Is it possible to resurrect the dead? Well, my answer is both yes and no. I'll answer this question at the end of the video when all the plots are unlocked, so let's accept this spiritual atmosphere for now. Monokuma isn't entirely lying. Angie, who seemed very active yesterday, has gathered loyal followers, Kibo, Tenko, Himiko, Sumugi, and finally Gonta, forming the student council devoted to the god Auda. Additionally, Gonta discovered that the mysterious writing, Horse A, had more letters added, making everyone believe it was left by ghosts. In the evening, Maki invites Shuichi to train outside because Kaito isn't feeling well and wants her to train with Shuichi anyway. They have a small conversation about why Shuichi is doing this even though it doesn't help his detective skills. Shuichi realizes that training isn't so bad, it helps him forget heavy thoughts, and being around Kaido always brings a strange sense of comfort. Kaido is a good friend. Maki also starts to understand the feeling of being around Kaido, although she feels envious of how carefree he can be. After understanding Shuichi's answer, she returns to her room, only to be informed that the student council has banned anyone from going out at nighttime. Miki shares this with Shuichi the next morning, leading to some arguments about the council's authority and the idea that the group should live in harmony from now on. Monodom is pleased and gives the group a new flashback light to help them make up quickly. Suddenly, a loud bang is heard. Angie breaks the light, claiming that the god Auda has decided not to use it anymore because it only makes the students remember the outside world and want to escape. Angie continues, saying she will perform the resurrection ritual. Meanwhile, Kaido seems to be zoning out, although he tells Shuichi he's fine and just needs some rest. Training time arrives, but Kaito still isn't well. With no other choice, Shuichi and Maki go outside and encounter Tenko, who is a double agent within the student council, trying to protect Himiko. She wants to observe Angie's strange actions and stop the resurrection ritual because she fears a murder might occur. Thanks to Tenko, a council member, they manage to invite Angie out and are invited inside, only to see four wax statues of the deceased students standing in the room, clearly made by Angie. The group tries to persuade Angie to stop the ritual, but she's too close to finishing to give up easily. Returning empty-handed, Tenko meets Himiko, and they argue about their increasingly strained relationship. The next day, Shuichi, Kaido, and Maki go to Angie's lab, where they find Himiko standing outside, calling for Angie with no response. Sensing something wrong and without a key to open the door, Kokichi appears with his lock-picking skills to help them get inside, only to discover Angie dead with the wax statues hanging around. As usual, everyone mourns Angie's death, and Kaido quickly encourages everyone, asking Maki to help Shuichi with the investigation. They realize it's a locked room murder. Angie died around 2 a.m. from a fatal wound to the back of her neck, but Maki's assassin experience reveals a minor head wound as well. While the group questions what happened to Angie, Korekyo suggests summoning Angie's spirit to ask her directly who the killer is. It's quite mystical, and Kyo says that spirit possession is entirely possible, unlike Monokuma's resurrection ritual. Persuaded, Himiko agrees with Kyo. 
and when Kyo says the group needs a dark room and about five people, Himiko chooses the middle room of the three empty rooms on this floor. The five people preparing are Kokichi, Kyo, Himiko, Tenko, and the robot Kibo, who definitely doesn't count as a human. Shuichi discovers a tape covered in hair, possibly left by the culprit, which seems a bit unrealistic since tape in the game easily tears and leaves clues. Additionally, there's a motive book for the resurrection ritual that Angie took for herself when Monokuma handed it out. The ritual involves burning the book, which seems like a Monokuma trick to drive students to despair. This has nothing to do with the hanging wax statues, leading us to investigate further. We find that the culprit could have created the first locked room mystery using the gold-painted sword from Korakio's lab, which was stuck to Keide's wax statue. We also see gold paint on the door lock, which is loose enough to lock with a light force, likely from the sword hitting it. This suggests the culprit hung the statue with a rope in Angie's lab, using a twisting motion to lock the door from the inside, creating a locked room, a method that leaves too many traces, or as we call it, mid. Investigating Korekio's lab, we meet Kokichi, who is there to get the sheath needed for the seance. His real purpose is to see the magic circle used in the ritual. Kokichi wanted to join the seance from the start because he sensed something off. Shuichi, guided by Kokichi, memorizes the magic circle with his detective skills. This makes Shuichi curious, so he attends the seance with Kokichi to see if Kyo draws it correctly without the book. However, the group's attention shifts to a heated discussion about replacing Kibo with Shuichi, who is more suitable for the human spirit ritual. Feeling betrayed, Kibo leaves, clearly hurt. You guys really did him dirty. Korekio insists that a girl must be in the center of the magic circle for Angie's spirit to possess. Initially, Himiko volunteers, but Tenko stops her, offering herself instead because she knows Himiko wants to talk to Angie. She gives Himiko an encouraging speech, which feels like a death flag. The seance begins. Tenko follows instructions, kneeling in the circle with a stone placed. The group places the iron cage, Korekio covers it with a cloth, and they place the bronze dog statue on top. Everyone stands at the corners, turns off the candles, and returns to their positions. When Tenko says she's ready and falls silent, the four remaining members sing the spirit summoning song in unison. During the song, a loud noise suddenly occurs. When the song ends, Kyo and Himiko discover that Tenko is dead. Everyone is almost paralyzed by the shock. Korakio asks the Monocubs what happens if there are two culprits. Monodam, unprepared for this, calls back Monokuma, who was on vacation. Laughing, Monokuma says only the culprit of the first murder counts and can graduate, the second murder is pointless. The Monokuma file reveals that Tenko died from a fatal wound to the back of her neck, similar to the first case. We can't rule out the possibility of the same culprit for both murders, despite Monokuma's distractions. Once again, Kaido is terrified, thinking it's a demonic trick, and jumps to hug Maki. Opportunist of the year, I would do the same in that situation. Although Kaito took a punch, his condition is more serious than I thought. Kibo, who was upgraded by Mew Iruma, now has a flashlight feature. With its light, we discovered blood splattered on the cage, and it seems the weapon is here, along with a wooden plank that was mysteriously lifted. The magic circle was smudged by everyone, the cloth was also stained with blood, and in the corner of the room, we found a small hole. Crawling through it, we found a sickle, possibly the weapon, more blood, and even dried blood stains that don't seem to belong to Tenko. The culprit even sawed off the top part of the wood. Outside, I met Kokichi again. Who admitted that his blood was real and that he got hit by a wooden plank while investigating the adjacent rooms, where another plank was lifted from the floor. Before he could share his conclusion, the group was summoned to the class trial. So, who is the culprit in Angie's case? Not talking about the locked door, which can be explained as I mentioned earlier, Kokichi confessed to being the culprit to gauge the real culprit's reaction and lure them out. With no concrete evidence to confirm the culprit 100%, the group decided to find Tenko's killer first, following Himiko's wish. Based on prior preparations, Korakio was the prime suspect. Although he initially denied it, the position of the sickle and the misdrawn magic circle to guide him in the dark were telling. When he tried to blame Himiko, who had chosen one of the three random rooms, Kokichi's evidence exposed him, as he had prepared all the rooms similarly, with a lever where the victim awaited death. Unable to deny it any longer, Korekio confessed but remained arrogant, claiming that even if he killed Tenko, it had nothing to do with Angie's case, which could lead the group to their deaths while he graduated alone. Shuichi quickly realized that the culprit of both cases could be the same, meaning Angie wasn't killed in her lab but in the empty room, as there were small dried bloodstains from the floor. According to the Resurrection Guidebook, Angie needed candles to burn the book, so she would go to the empty room where the nearest candles were, and accidentally discovered Kyo preparing for his crime. 
Correcchio gradually lost control, revealing his split personality, believing his sister's spirit lived within him. There was no doubt that Correcchio was the culprit. So, how did he do it? The first case happened the night before. While the culprit was cutting wood for his ritual murder plan, Angie walked in looking for candles for her resurrection ritual and saw the culprit preparing something in the middle room. This disrupted his original plan, but he didn't give up. He hit Angie with a freshly cut plank, knocking her out, then taped her head wound to stop the bleeding, took her back to her lab, and removed the tape. However, he overlooked a piece of tape that fell off, which is quite unrealistic as tape is usually durable and hard to tear unless cut by something sharp. The culprit brought a sword from his lab and finished Angie off. To cover his crime, he created a locked room mystery by hanging the wax statues upside down and using the sword to hit the lock, making the door lock from the inside. Since the latch was loose, a light force could move it. Acting while everyone was asleep, the culprit could try repeatedly until he succeeded. The next morning, thanks to Kokichi picking the lock, we discovered Angie's body. But the culprit wasn't done yet. Taking advantage of the spiritual atmosphere, he suggested the group hold a seance. When Shuichi took Kibo's place, the culprit used the stone Himiko picked up to instruct Tenko to lie in the exact position for the crime. After setting the iron cage, the culprit volunteered to place the cloth where the sickle, the murder weapon, was hidden. The moving statue acted as a stabilizer for the weapon. As the seance began, and everyone started singing, the culprit used the darkness to follow the salt trail on the floor to locate Tenko. Using the pre-sawed wooden plank as a lever, the culprit jumped down hard, causing Tenko to be flung to the top of the iron cage, killing her instantly. The culprit then retraced his steps back to his position. When the lights came on, Tenko was discovered dead. Amidst the chaos, the culprit disposed of the weapon through a gap in the empty room. However, thanks to Kibo's flashlight and camera features, we saw through the culprit's lies. It was none other than the ultimate anthropologist, Korekio. So why did he do it? It turns out, he had a complex relationship with his sister, who might have done terrible things to him, forcing Korekio to kill her. Unable to bear the guilt, he believed his sister's spirit lived within him, and felt obligated to kill 100 girls to keep her company so she wouldn't be lonely. In the end, Correcchio faced punishment both physically and spiritually for his crimes. In the aftermath, everyone argued, but only Himiko cried loudly, mourning her two friends. Her tears moved the group, making them realize the cruelty of the killing game. Exhausted from crying, Himiko fell asleep and Gonta carried her back. Meanwhile, Kaido was coughing up blood, signaling his deteriorating health. Chapter 3 ended. Chapter 4 began with Rontaro revealing that this wasn't his first time, and that he had to survive for reasons unknown to us. The group gathered in the dining hall, where Himiko had regained her spirit, ready to carry on the will of their lost friends. Ganta noticed new writings that no one knew who made. Monokuma started distributing items to unlock new areas, including a card key as a motive. Without delay, Kokichi snatched it to prevent anyone else from using it and disappeared. Near Mew's lab, we found Kibo's lab filled with sci-fi equipment, which Kibo wasn't too fond of. We also reached the fifth floor, where Tsumugi's lab was located, and had a fun water-drinking scene. Shuichi's lab was also there, filled with poison bottles and 52 volumes of case files, though only the first three had real case photos, the rest were illustrations. Kaido informed everyone about finding a new flashback light, and even Kokichi returned, claiming he hadn't used the motive yet. Unable to verify Kokichi's words, the group used the flashback light to recall memories about the meteorite incident, protests, and the gopher project created to save humanity. 
Kokichi remembered the project failing, and as the group struggled to piece together their memories, Kokichi claimed he needed just one more clue to understand the story. We also saw the remaining monocubs acting strangely, influenced by Korekyo's story about sibling romance. Finally, at nighttime, we had a training session with Maki, who was curious about Shuichi's feelings for Keide and how they developed so quickly. She wasn't too concerned but returned to her room when the idiot Kaido showed up looking for them. Ganta continuously wanted to be useful and become a gentleman. The next morning, he proposed a plan to attack Monokuma. Kokichi, seeing the foolishness of revealing their plan to the mastermind, took on the villain role and suggested continuing the killing game, just to get punched in the face by Kaido, while Miu started hinting about her plan to save everyone. When night came, Kaito suggested the group should talk to understand each other better. Besides the small talk, we learned about Maki's past in the orphanage, where an organization came and she volunteered to be trained as an assassin to protect the other kids. Every night, she was beaten to a pulp and cried her eyes out. In a private place, Kokichi asked Monokuma to talk about using the motive again because he realized someone was planning something interesting. The next day, in the computer room, Miu cooked up a virtual reality program and wanted everyone to enter it to stop the killing game. But since it was Monokuma's original program, no one accepted it easily. Only when Kokichi manipulated everyone by putting words in Monokuma's mouth, making the bear admit that there were secrets about the outside world in this virtual world, did people start to listen. Miu also admitted she worked hard to remove all dangerous items from this virtual world. She even knelt down to everyone. Kokichi encouraged the group to accept it for Miu's sake, so Kaido encouraged everyone to hold on to hope. Then, each person took a seat. Miu instructed them to connect the memory and subconscious cables correctly to upload their avatars into the world. She wasn't sure what would happen if they were connected wrong. Himiko assured them it was easy, just use the hand holding the chopsticks to plug in the cable first. So, we entered the virtual world called Neo. When Shuichi logged in, Kokichi and Gonta followed shortly after, and Miu was the last. She explained that items in this world couldn't be destroyed. To log out, everyone had to pick up the phone in the spa room and say their name. In this world, everyone, including Gonta and Kokichi, had equal strength and speed. Outside the room there was a map of the virtual world, designed by Miu, who claimed that nothing could exist outside the map's boundaries. Although Kokichi pressed her about the accuracy of the map, Miu sweated a bit but Kokichi didn't care and intended to leave the group to find information alone. Since Kokichi had taken the motive at the beginning but couldn't use it, the group didn't trust him and suggested someone follow him. Ganta, wanting to be useful, volunteered. Kokichi didn't seem to care on the surface but was happy that Ganta followed him. The rest went to the rooftop, where they saw snow falling and felt the cold as if in the real world. Shuichi checked the warehouse and found no dangerous objects that could be used as weapons. Finally, the group left the mansion to cross the river, only to find there was no bridge. Miu said there was a plank at the end of the river to make a temporary bridge. Shuichi fetched the plank and everyone crossed because objects in this virtual world couldn't be destroyed. Kokichi and Gonta returned, saying there were no clues in the forest. The group crossed a boundary point, losing consciousness for a short while. Miu explained it was a map load like in games, convincing everyone. At the messy church, Miu decided to split the group into two to search the mansion and the church faster. Kokichi whispered something to Miu and volunteered to return to the mansion. So a group consisting of Shuichi, Kaito, Kokichi, Gonta, and Sumugi returned to the mansion. Miu carefully saw them off, only to throw the plank of the temporary bridge away after they crossed. Confused by Miu's actions, the group decided to search before figuring out how to help those at the church cross the river. Ganta continued searching outside. Kaido was on the rooftop, and Kokichi was in the spa room. Meanwhile, Tsumugi and Shuichi were searching the dining hall and kitchen, but after a while, they still found nothing. Tsumugi told Shuichi that she saw Miu outside the mansion about 10 minutes ago, which was strange considering how she could have crossed the river. Before they could think further, a loud boom sounded like something hitting the wall followed by Kibo's voice, startling them. They ran outside and met Ganta, who said he didn't hear anything. Since Ganta isn't one to lie easily, Shuichi suspected they might have misheard and headed to the other side of the bridge. The three hurriedly told Shuichi to find a way to cross over and check on Miu's avatar, which was lying motionless. But the plank had floated away down the river. Kokichi reported that the plank had somehow drifted to the end of the river downstream. Kokichi showed everyone, and Ganta volunteered to carry it so they could all cross the river. Maki suggested the group log out to check on Miu, since her avatar was unresponsive and she wasn't answering calls. She was also worried because Kaito was nowhere to be seen. One by one, they logged out. When only Shuichi and Kokichi were left, Kokichi urged Shuichi to join his side to stop this killing game. But due to Kokichi's habit of lying without blinking, Shuichi angrily logged out without saying a word, only to find Miu had suffocated outside without anyone noticing.
scene of Mew's death. Kaito was still alive, claiming he was logged out automatically and didn't know if he should log back in. He decided to sleep in his room because he felt unwell, only returning when the victim was discovered. Not fully trusting Kaito, Kokichi accused him and advised Shuichi not to cooperate with Kaito in this case, suggesting instead to work with Kokichi. Despite not wanting to doubt his close friend, Shuichi, as a detective, reluctantly agreed temporarily. The investigation began, revealing Miu died around 6.30 a.m. with no external injuries, but her body showed signs of resisting strangulation. Near Kokichi's chair was a vial of poison from Shuichi's lab, which could cause death with a small dose. But the victim would have bloodshot eyes, which Miu didn't have, making poisoning unlikely. Himiko testified that Miu volunteered to search outside the church and shortly after, they heard a loud noise like something hitting the church. When they went outside, they found Miu's avatar lying motionless. Gonta claimed he knew nothing, saying it felt like he was dreaming. With her assassin skills, Maki searched the files and found information that external impacts in the virtual world could transmit pain signals, and a fatal injury could cause death from shock in the real world. While searching further, Kokichi dismissed it as useless, saying the files might have been altered or deleted. Monotaro, the bear with a special bond with Mew, decided to help Kokichi analyze the files despite the pink bear's objections. Shortly after, they found no files had been altered or deleted. Additionally, a login and logout time chart for each person was found, which was important to remember. Mew logged in last, and Kaido was logged out first. Monotaro added that older files had been altered, but needed time to analyze. Following Kibo, the group returned to the virtual world to investigate further, as Mew might have died in the virtual world, causing her real-world death from shock. Only Maki, Kokichi, and Sumugi stayed outside to watch over Monotaro until the analysis was complete. Inside Neo, Shuichi discovered a roll of toilet paper outside the mansion, which was quite strange. Upon reaching the church, they discovered that the wooden plank was taken from the storage on the rooftop. Miu also had a hammer, which seemed like a weapon she would erase, but she kept it with her. Additionally, there was a phone that could be used to log out, or even force others to log out. Shuichi tested it on Kaito and confirmed its accuracy. Regarding the voice Shuichi and Sumugi heard, it was Kibo who heard the loud bang on the church and ran to check, shouting when he saw Miu's avatar. Kibo added that he heard Kokichi whispering to Miu about a meeting on the rooftop. The group returned to the rooftop with an angry Kaido, who was forced to log out without warning. Shuichi confirmed that the plank from the storage was missing and found near Miu's avatar at the church, also noting the strange flow of the river. At this moment, Maki announced that the bear had finished analyzing the data. Exiting the virtual world, Shuichi questioned Kokichi, who claimed he never met Miu. Monotaro's analysis confirmed that Miu had erased many dangerous items but left the hammer for some reason. The phone was a standard item in the Neo world that Mew had hidden from everyone. Furthermore, the world was divided into two object types, human and non-human. Mew had changed her avatar's attribute to non-human for some reason, without altering her appearance. She also added a feature, allowing non-human objects to pass through walls. Kokichi's avatar was altered so that if Mew touched it, it would become immobile. Lastly, there was an error in someone's VR setup before entering the virtual world for the first time, which Monotaro couldn't identify. Shuichi was saved by Monotaro's useful information, really carrying hard in Chapter 4. Before they could ask more, Monokuma announced the start of the class trial. Okay, since this is a complex case, let's explain the how done it first. Initially, we see Miu's real intention, bringing the phone, hammer, changing her and Kokichi's avatars, arranging a meeting on the rooftop, and discarding the only bridge plank, all part of her plan to kill Kokichi Oma. How did she get to the mansion? We can trust Tsumugi's testimony of seeing Miu outside the mansion and the loud bang from the church side, along with Kibo's scream heard by Shuichi and Tsumugi. It could be from a special wall Miu designed to pass through. Kaito objected, saying everyone agreed, nothing existed beyond that wall. This leads to the second clue. The makeshift bridge plank should have floated to the church's end, but got stuck at the mansion's base, like in a game. This is impossible, with two different walls, unless the walls connected through the mansion as one. From the start, Miu's map was entirely reversed from the actual map, with the load point being the loop's repeat part, and the church and mansion separated by a single wall. Kokichi realized this when he first saw the map. We must understand that Miu had initially asked Kokichi to cooperate to persuade everyone to live peacefully in the Neo world, but Kokichi saw through her plan. Before the night Miu invited everyone, Kokichi met Monokuma privately and said, subscribe to Pepe TV to support me, Kokichi, in continuing to produce quality videos. We still don't know Miu's motive for wanting to kill Kokichi. Although she was often bullied by Kokichi in previous class trials, that reason alone isn't enough to conclude. More evidence is Miu logging in last to place the poison vial on Kokichi's chair and logging out Kaito on the rooftop to frame him. Let's review Miu Aruma's plan in an ideal scenario. After successfully convincing everyone to join the Neo world, Miu waited for everyone to log in, then went to Kokichi's chair and placed the poison vial to make everyone think he was murdered outside. 
as the possibility of dying from shock in the virtual world was something Miwaruma deliberately kept secret. Under Miu's leadership, she perfectly divided the group so that Kokichi and Kaito were together, with Kaito searching the rooftop. She escorted the group to the bridge and pretended to accidentally drop the plank as a joke. By suggesting they search outside and adding a wall that only non-human objects could pass through, as well as changing her avatar from a human object to a non-human object, which we wouldn't have known without Monotaro's help, Miu successfully crossed to the mansion. However, Tsumugi saw her entering. Upon arrival, Miu used the mobile phone to force Kaido to log out, something she also kept hidden from the group. By arranging a meeting with Kokichi on the rooftop and altering Kokichi's avatar to make him immobile, Miu was confident she could kill Kokichi and frame Kaido. In the Neo world, there were no injuries, and in the real world, the possibility of dying from shock was also kept secret by Miu. I must say, Miu was quite clumsy but also pretty smart. So, how did Kokichi survive while Miu ended up dead? How did Kokichi outsmart Miu, despite not having enough information about her schemes? Let's return to the class trial to find out. When the group discovered the truth about the map, Kokichi laughed loudly, as if he knew everything. Indeed, Miu moved from the church to the mansion, was killed on the rooftop, and her body was moved back to the church. How did they do that, though? During the investigation, the wooden plank from the rooftop storage was missing and found near Miu's body. Kokichi pointed out that the snow-covered roof and the slope were perfect for placing Miu's avatar and the items she carried, sliding down and hitting the church. This led Shuichi to accuse Kokichi of lying about not being on the rooftop, as Kokichi could describe it perfectly without seeing it. Kokichi retorted that Himeko had accidentally mentioned it on the way. He spent most of his time waiting in the starting salon. This prompted Shuichi to lie to extract the secret Kokichi was hiding and to lead everyone during the class trial. He claimed that he had asked Kaito to check on Kokichi before Kaito was logged out and didn't see him, implying that Kokichi could have killed Miu in some clever way that Shuichi couldn't yet deduce. Kaito agreed to play along with Shuichi's lie and everyone blindly believed Shuichi. Shuichi regained control and threatened Kokichi from this point, despite Kokichi being an ally during the investigation. Kokichi realized that everyone was ganging up on him, lying all the time. When the hero of the story, Shuichi, did this, everyone praised and supported him, which really pissed Kokichi off. Kokichi's precise words were, Why do you guys hate lies so much? There's only one truth, but endless possibilities for lies, you know? And some of them are only white lies, or lies to be kind to people. If you deny all of that just because it's a lie, then that means you guys are just terrible at being lied to. Seriously, the worst. Kokichi really is the goat with this one. From now on, there will be no more detective games or investigations. Kokichi will reveal evidence and information that no one can deny, to see if they still think he only knows how to lie. He drops a harsh truth on the group. Ganta is the culprit. At this point, Kokichi was defending himself against everyone's accusations, especially from Shuichi, whom he had hoped to trust and cooperate with to end this killing game. Shuichi betrayed him and lied straight to his face. Kokichi admitted to collaborating with Monokuma, using the secret of the outside world to persuade Ganta. Despite Ganta repeatedly denying and claiming he remembered nothing, everyone, especially Kaido, sided with Ganta, rejecting the truth Kokichi provided. If we think about it, no one else could have killed Miu except Ganta. Kaido was logged out and never logged back in. Shuichi and Sumugi were together when they heard Miu's body crash into the church, and Kokichi's avatar was altered to make him unable to fight Miu. Only Ganta had the capability to kill Miu at that time. Despite Ganta's continuous denials, Kokichi kept berating him, making the atmosphere tense and reaching peak fiction. Himiko told Kokichi to stop bullying Ganta, but that's what the group had been doing to Kokichi throughout the four chapters of class trials. Even Kaido couldn't hold back anymore and told Kokichi to shut up, saying he would rather die than believe Kokichi's words. The two argued fiercely, with Kaido's arguments full of holes and Kokichi's being perfectly logical. Shuichi felt heartbroken seeing them fight and decided to side with the truth to protect his friends. With Ganta still claiming he knew nothing and remembered nothing, saying the virtual world felt like a dream, Shuichi finally recalled Monotaro's mention of an issue with someone's VR setup before entering Neo for the first time. It turned out, Ganta had mistakenly swapped the memory and subconscious cables because Himiko told the group to hold the chopsticks first. But Ganta, being left-handed, held them in his left hand. This meant he truly remembered nothing about what happened in the Neo world. With enough evidence proving Ganta was the culprit, the group made their decision. Kokichi said, This is the truth you are all searching for. This is the truth you want so badly. Even in the final moments, Kaido refused to accept the truth and trusted Ganta, pointing out the last hole in the argument. If Ganta threw Miu's body from the rooftop, how did he get down to the first floor so quickly? It was because he used a roll of toilet paper to wrap around the observation tower's pole and climbed down, leaving the roll on the ground. Kokichi realized Ganta didn't follow his plan to put the roll back in the bathroom and cursed him again. Shuichi stopped Kokichi's actions, 
calmly, respectfully, and emotionally encouraging Ganta, recounting what happened once more, so Ganta could accept the crime he committed without any memory of it. Back to when Miu went to the rooftop, everything seemed to go according to her plan, except she didn't know Kokichi had already collaborated with the culprit. Seeing Kokichi, Miu intended to kill him, but was strangled with a roll of toilet paper by the hidden culprit. Remember, objects in the virtual world couldn't be destroyed or broken. Kokichi instructed the culprit on how to dispose of the body and left the rooftop to avoid suspicion. The culprit used the plank to slide Miu's avatar down the roof and then used the same tool to climb down to the ground floor, but was caught by Shuichi and Sumugi. In a panic, the culprit threw the tool away and claimed not to have heard any noise, which was obviously a lie. The culprit, who didn't remember his crime, was none other than Ganta Gokuhara, the ultimate entomologist. Ganta cried because he couldn't understand why a gentleman like him would do such a thing, why he could kill the friends he wanted to protect. He cried not because he was exposed, but because he couldn't comprehend his actions. So let's get to the answer to the final question. Why done it? Monokuma ultimately programmed Ganta's subconscious in the Neo virtual world into an alter ego Ganta. The truth is, while searching with Kokichi, Ganta discovered the reality of the outside world, which he considered hell. If the school grounds were hell, then the outside world was even worse. Not wanting his friends to experience such despair and wanting to do something useful, Ganta carried out Kokichi's plan to prevent Mew from killing Kokichi and leaving him alone to endure that hellish world. In a flashback, we see even Mew was surprised that her perfect plan, which she thought was genius, was seen through by Kokichi. But she still confidently believed he should die so her inventions could save the world. Much like Senku. However, Ganta killed her before hearing those hopeful words and apologized immediately after. But the plan failed entirely. Ganta and his alter ego apologized for their foolishness. Even Kokichi was overwhelmed with emotion at Ganta's pitiful state, offering to die in Ganta's place since he masterminded the plan. Of course, Ganta refused and accepted his punishment. With Ganta and the Monocubs gone, everyone fell into a real crisis. Maki demanded Kokichi reveal the secret of the outside world. Although Kokichi initially didn't want to, he quickly slipped into his villain role, claiming he didn't care about the death of that stupid Ganta and that he would win this game. He also admitted that nothing satisfied him more than seeing everyone turn on each other in this killing game. Kaito, unable to bear it, tried to punch Kokichi again, but this time Kokichi dodged and punched back, telling Kaito he was weak now. Maki, angrier than ever, was about to kill Kokichi, but Shuichi stopped her, pointing out why no one trusted him. Kokichi told them to keep not trusting him, and that he would win this game, then left. Kaido, at his limit, coughed up blood, still denying it was from Kokichi's punch and refusing Shuichi's help, feeling betrayed in this trial. He left. Kokichi walked alone in the dark, realizing it was time to end this killing game, and only he could do it. The letters filled in, declaring, This world is mine, Kokichioma. Chapter 4 ended. Chapter 4 was absolutely peak. We should continue right to chapter 5. The tension between Kaito and Shuichi hadn't fully healed. Kaito was cold towards Shuichi, and everyone was discussing Kokichi's actions when Monokuma appeared again, awarding the last real key and the real last key. This prompted everyone to continue searching for clues about the secret only Kokichi and Ganta knew. With the real last key, we climbed a thousand step staircase to Kaito's lab, which simulated a spaceship and had the Gopher project. The last real key led to Rontaro's lab, but since he died before unlocking it, the room couldn't be opened anymore. Finally, the only place left to explore was an outdoor warehouse with a room protected by advanced infrared security. Even Kibo triggered alarms when approaching, forcing Monokuma to guide Shuichi and Kibo on how to unlock it. 
The password was too long to remember, but upon unlocking it, we found it was where the Exocell robots controlled by the Monocubs were stored. But now, with the Monocubs gone, the robots were left unused. In this place, there's also a hydraulic press to crush machinery. It's so advanced that it has sensors to stop if it detects a human inside. Kibo tried it out because he wanted to see if the machine would recognize him as a human. But as we know, Kibo is a robot, so just before being crushed, he rolled away in the most miraculous way. Himiko arrived to find the two and told them to gather in the cafeteria because Tsumugi had an important discovery. They thought it was a flashback light, but it turned out to be the message, This world is mine, Kokichioma. The group dispersed until nightfall. Maki proactively sought out Shuichi and invited him to her lab, where Kaido was also invited. Maki showed Kaido how to use a bow, because not everyone can use it. Her goal was to help Shuichi and Kaido reconcile, but Kaido ignored Shuichi and said he didn't feel well. Maki scolded Shuichi for not trying at all, revealing Kaido's illness is real. The next day, Kaito urgently called everyone to rise against Monokuma, the bear now without robot or Monoku protection. They prepared weapons from Maki's lab, only to find out in the evening that Monokuma had disappeared. Gathering in the gym, the group had enough weapons when Kokichi appeared with hammers for everyone. Kokichi was ready to provide them, as they could disable the electromagnetic circuits of any device, robot, or gate. He even had three bombs that could disable any non-human electronic device within a 100-meter radius, though he kept them for self-defense. Thanks to Miu Iruma's cooperation, we learned Kokichi's goal was to end the killing game. Miu, on the other hand, didn't think it was a good idea and believed they couldn't fight Monokuma and the robots. She didn't want to die there, so she agreed to help Kokichi, using him as a guinea pig before she was ready to stand up. But Kokichi kept asking without acting, giving Miu enough motive and plan to kill him. This was Miu Aruma's main motive, the ultimate inventor. Kokichi, however, was aware of Miu's distrust and her intent to kill him, seeing through her plans. If he survived the simulation, Miu would find another way to kill him, and she was smart enough to devise a decent plan. So, Kokichi had to use poor Ganta. Back to reality, Kokichi mentioned the hammer's battery was weak and not optimized, taking 24 hours to recharge. Keeping this in mind, Kokichi continued to lie about not knowing the secret, despite using the motive in Chapter 4. Maki couldn't stand it and choked Kokichi for the second time, aiming to steal one of his three bombs with her assassin skills. With no other choice, Kokichi stopped joking and let the group act on their own. Kokichi suggested the group use the escape route Keide had tried before. With the disabling hammer in hand, the group easily reached the door to the outside world, only to find toxic air and a desolate, lifeless earth. This was the hell Ganta spoke of the apocalyptic earth with no hope for the students. It meant all the previous culprits' attempts to escape were meaningless, and the killing game was just entertainment. Kokichi laughed maniacally as the students woke up from their shock-induced coma. Let's reveal the whole truth. The Gopher Project was created to send 16 ultimate students into space to restore life after the earth was destroyed by meteorites. Initially, the students didn't want to leave their families, leading to the ultimate hunt protests, which forced the students to take responsibility, or humanity would be wiped out. The organization had to spread fake news that the 16 ultimate students had died. Eventually, when hope was restored, the group agreed to the gopher project and began the cryogenic sleep process. But there was a mastermind who planted the robot bear Monokuma to crash the ship back to Earth, creating a killing game where the 16 students who were supposed to work together to restore life ended up killing each other for entertainment. And that mastermind was none other than me, Kokichi Oma. Wahahaha! <laughs> Kokichi claimed to be the mastermind, and even when doubted, he summoned the Exosol robots to prove it. He said he was tired of the game he created and that it would end now, suggesting they live peacefully in the academy, which the group refused. Kaito, enraged, charged at Kokichi, but was captured by the Exosols. Maki tried to rescue Kaito, but Shuichi stopped her, fearing Kokichi's deadly aura. Kokichi had perfectly timed the disabling hammer to run out of battery when the group tried to use it against his Exosols. Kokichi was nothing short of a super genius. Now, the group had to accept that the academy was the only world they could live in but they were just living like soulless bodies. Following Shuichi, who could no longer fulfill the promise to explore the outside world with Kaide, he isolated himself in his room for days, not bathing or eating, living a life without purpose or hope. Before he could completely self-destruct, Maki came to his room, demanding he clean up and join them in the dining hall because Tsumugi had found another flashback light and wanted everyone to see it. When Shuichi arrived at the dining hall, the group remembered a glimmer of hope once more. They recalled Hope's Peak Academy, the killing games created by Junko Enoshima, the ultimate despair, and the worst event in human history. They also remembered that Makoto Naegi, the ultimate hope, created the Gopher Project, selecting the 16 students because they were immune to the virus brought by the meteorites that wiped out humanity. This crucial information meant that if the students were immune to the virus, they still had hope to restore Earth. But before they could do that, they had to defeat the remnants of despair, Kokichi Oma, 
who was linked to Junko and Oshima, according to the memories they regained from the flashback light. The group felt revived, filled with the will of hope, determined to defeat Kokichi Oma. Meanwhile, Kokichi and Kaido, who didn't receive the flashback light or this information, had to figure out how to outsmart the hopeful students. The group decided to rescue Kaido first, using the disabling hammer and the bomb Maki found to take down Kokichi's robots and defeat him. Maki was the first to report seeing Kokichi in the warehouse with the Exosols, so they planned to act the next day. That night, Shuichi scouted the area and saw Monokuma standing guard while the Exosols patrolled in a circle to protect him. Through a bathroom window where Kato was held, Shuichi communicated with Kato about the rescue plan for the next day. They reconciled and resolved their conflict. Kato encouraged Shuichi, revealing his own plan to confront Kokichi. The next morning, everyone brought the fully charged disabling hammer, while Maki carried a knife, saying it suited her talents better. The group stormed the building and found three robots already disabled, with Monokuma nowhere to be seen. As they opened the gate, Shuichi noticed multiple knife marks on the password lock, raising concerns. They used the hammer to disable the protective barrier on the rolling door. When they opened it, they discovered a crushed body under the hydraulic press, with a piece of Kaito's sleeve outside. The announcement, the body has been discovered, played, and Monokuma appeared, admitting even he didn't know who the victim was. Shuichi tried to restart the hydraulic press to find clues, but it was futile as someone had cut the wires. This raised another question. The hydraulic press was supposed to detect living beings and stop, yet the victim was crushed without any system errors or safety failures. They also found one of the four robots still active with its door open, as if someone had controlled it, and a long blood trail leading to the bathroom. There, they found a crossbow from Maki's lab, her bag, three blood-stained arrows, and a bottle of unknown substance with its label smeared with blood from Shuichi's lab. Outside, Kibo reported seeing Himiko last night carrying a bag from Maki's lab. Shuichi kept this in mind as he checked the exosols and found a drained disabling hammer. Monokuma added that the robots had used the hammer to disable his movements, not to protect him, and he revealed this to help solve the case because he needed it resolved. At Maki's lab, they confirmed the weapons at the scene were taken from there. At Shuichi's lab, they found a slow-acting poison that guaranteed death and an antidote bottle on the table. While deep in thought, Shuichi was called by Kibo, who found Kokichi's jacket with two bloodstains, one on the back and one on the shoulder, as if shot by arrows. Monokuma then summoned everyone to the class trial, where the victim was Y and the culprit was X. The group hoped to find out if Kokichi or Kaido survived, while Maki insisted the crushed body was Kaido and Kokichi, the remnant of despair, was the culprit. Shuichi, as usual, found suspicious points worth discussing. At this moment, the culprit X appeared in an exocile, initially speaking in Kaido's voice, shocking the students, but then switched to Kokichi's mocking tone. He showed a video from a camera, revealing Kaido lying motionless under the hydraulic press. Boom! The group was shocked, and X claimed the video was original, with no edits or tampering, forcing Monokuma to accept it as true. However, something didn't make sense. Kokichi said he was the mastermind and was tired of the killing game, so why would he continue by killing Kaito? Maki argued that Kokichi, as a remnant of despair and a follower of Junko and Oshima, would continue the game until despair won, leaving even X confused when Junko was mentioned. This made it pretty clear that even X didn't understand what Maki was talking about, despite both Kaito and Kokichi not receiving the memories from the latest flashback light. But if they were the mastermind, they would surely know. Additionally, the long blood trail from the door and the arrow marks make us question whether the crime was caused by the hydraulic press. Shuichi asked Himiko about bringing the bag last night, as Kibo testified, and Himiko admitted she brought the crossbow and arrows at Kaito's request to help him fight Kokichi. Maki dismissed all arguments, stating it was pointless because it was clear as day who the culprit X was. At this point, X changed their voice to Kaido's, claiming the robot's voice-changing function made it impossible to be 100% sure who X was, similar to Schrodinger's cat experiment. The cat's state of being alive and dead exists on two two branches of the universe, both real but not interacting. Referencing Umineko Far, while everyone was arguing, Himiko suddenly remembered she only brought one arrow, not the three bloody arrows found at the scene. This suggested a third person might have joined the fight, someone skilled with a crossbow, which not everyone knows how to assemble. Additionally, the hammer at the scene was out of power, and there was evidence of an Exosol robot being controlled by someone, along with knife marks at the lock. The only person lying and running from the truth was Maki Harakawa, the ultimate assassin who didn't bring her hammer this morning despite the group's agreement. Even if she tried to cover up using the crossbow, it wouldn't be lethal enough to kill anyone. However, a poisoned arrow from Shuichi's lab was more than enough to kill someone with one shot. 
Maki believed that killing the mastermind Kokichi, the remnant of despair, would end everyone's suffering. Shuichi confirmed Maki's involvement in the case, forcing her to reveal the truth. She went alone to settle the score with Kokichi, the common enemy of hope, which she and the group remembered through the flashback light. Disabling the robots with a spear, Maki saw Keito and Kokichi fighting. Seeing Kokichi about to use the remote to call a robot for protection, Maki's assassin instincts kicked in, and she shot Kokichi in the back, forcing him to reveal everything he was hiding. When Kokichi didn't speak, Maki intended to finish him off. But Kaito, not wanting Maki to become the culprit, took the arrow for Kokichi. Unfortunately, it was the poisoned arrow, causing panic. Maki ran to Shuichi's lab for the antidote. Just as she returned, the door had closed. Through the bathroom door crack, Maki called Kaito to give him the antidote. But Kokichi was quicker and snatched it from Kaito, gulping it down. Furious because it was the only and last antidote, Maki used a knife to break the door lock, hoping to get inside. But all her efforts were in vain and when she looked back through the bathroom door crack, Kaido and Kokichi were nowhere to be seen. She wanted everyone to vote for Kokichi to end this once and for all, leaving him alone in the apocalyptic world outside with no one to toy with. Yes, Maki admitted she accidentally killed Kaito and claimed that the person inside the robot, X, was Kokichi. But that wasn't enough to convince Shuichi. First, why did the hydraulic press lose its safety feature and crush Kaito? This meant Kokichi used Mew's disabling bomb to stop the press's human detection and protection function. But why would Kokichi do that? This led Shuichi to a hypothesis that Kokichi was trying to deceive everyone about who the culprit was between Kokichi and Maki. Since the poison arrow had a delayed effect, Kaito could have died before being crushed or because of the crushing. This made Monokuma sweat, and the group realized even the bear didn't know who the culprit was. Additionally, with no security cameras around the academy, the bear couldn't watch the entire incident. Remember this detail. Moreover, Monokuma admitted that Kokichi used the robots to monitor and limit Monokuma's movements, making it unable to move. This led Monokuma to join the investigation team. First, it confirmed Shuichi's hypothesis that Kokichi was trying to deceive not only the students, but also Principal Monokuma. Another important confirmation was that Kokichi wasn't the mastermind of this killing game. The action of using robots to stall the bear and the remote Kokichi held to control the robots was just another invention by Miuruma that Kokichi used to trick the group into believing he was the mastermind. The story Kokichi told about the outside world was nothing but a fabricated tale, resembling 80 to 90 percent of the original story based on the little information Kokichi had. Thanks to his genius, Kokichi fooled the group for quite a while. But Monokuma didn't want the game to end without knowing who the culprit was, so it questioned the video provided by Culprit X. Sure, it didn't go through any editing software, but there was an easier way, the pause button on the camera, with a slight glitch in the video. This evidence suggested that the person crushed under the press might not be Kaito, and Kaito and Kokichi could have switched places. The camera was positioned right at the corner of the control room, allowing the culprit to press the pause button on the camera and the hydraulic press. However, there was a flaw in Maki's argument that she saw Kokichi drink the antidote while Kaido was still poisoned. Why would they switch places if both would die? This led Shuichi to propose a crazy hypothesis that no ordinary person could think of. Kokichi wanted to create a case where it was impossible to determine who the culprit and the victim were to deceive everyone. He pretended to drink the antidote, but when Maki ran to break the door, Kokichi then forced Kaito to drink the antidote. He had cooperated with Kaito by threatening that if they didn't follow Kokichi's plan, Maki would be the culprit for killing Kokichi. Not wanting Maki to be punished, the two executed a crazy plan, using a disabling bomb to deactivate all the equipment and safety sensors. Kokichi and Kaito filmed and paused, switching places between the victim and the culprit. When it was Kaito's turn to press, there was an unavoidable small delay in the video, making Kaito the ultimate astronaut the culprit. However, Shuichi, knowing deep down that Kaito agreed to Kokichi's plan for some reason, used his final lie about seeing Kokichi in the hallway to propose this hypothesis. This brought the culprit's identity between Kokichi and Maki back into question, making Monokuma accuse Shuichi of bluffing. The bear angrily warned that even if there was a mistake, punishment was unavoidable, threatening to kill everyone despite not knowing 100% who the culprit was. Not wanting his friends to die unjustly, Kaito emerged from the exosol, confirming Shuichi's entire hypothesis and ending this 200 IQ case. Finally, we address the question, why did he do it? As Shuichi hypothesized, Kokichi didn't drink the antidote, but forced Kaido to. Despite still being poisoned, Kokichi devised a final plan to deceive Monokuma and the real mastermind of this game. He admitted that the phrase, the world is mine, Kokichi Oma, was just his preparation to convince everyone he was the mastermind and to declare the end of the game he created. When Kaito pressed him to explain why, Kokichi, instead of saying he enjoyed the game as before, bluntly stated he hated this killing game to the core and despised those watching it even more. He loathed those who disregarded the lives of the people here and enjoyed the killing game. Kokichi further asserted that the real mastermind had influenced Maki 
driving her to kill him, even though the killing game had ended. When asked if this was true, Maki admitted she only intended to kill Kokichi after receiving the flashback light about Kokichi being a remnant of despair and her side of hope needing to triumph over despair, just as the symbol of Hope's Peak Academy. Kaido added that although he didn't fully understand Kokichi's final deception plan, he chose to follow it because he saw Kokichi's determination. Kokichi even prepared a long script with lines fitting his personality for Kaido to act out while in the Exosol. However, Kaido questioned why Monokuma would care about breaking the rules and why there were observers. Kokichi explained that Monokuma acted according to the rules, even when at a disadvantage. Monokuma and the Monokubs always wanted to make the killing game more exciting, as confirmed by Kokichi in Chapter 4. This affirmed that everyone's lives here were just a show for those outside to watch. Kaido then shared his reasons for cooperating with Kokichi. It was the only way to ensure Maki's survival, and he was already close to death due to his illness, so he felt sacrificing himself was acceptable. This was strange, because Kaido remembered being perfectly healthy during his last health check. He might have contracted a virus from the meteorites, but this raised questions for Shuichi and the students, since the meteorite virus didn't harm them. According to the flashback light, they were chosen because they had antibodies against the virus, which made Monokuma go real quiet. Kaido praised Shuichi for his detective skills, seeing the truth even if Kokichi's elaborate plan to make the game seem like a scam didn't fully succeed. Kaido recounted Kokichi's thoughts during their final conversation. Kokichi said he had acted and forced himself to act until the very end to end the game he hated so much. The students were unsure if Kokichi was lying even in his final moments. This realization made Shuichi understand the essence of lying, saying, Kokichi, you are the embodiment of a lie. As Kaido's condition worsened, Monokuma wanted to proceed with the punishment quickly, reviving the Monokubs. Maki, not wanting Kaido to die, stood up against Monokuma. She admitted she had never felt human connection before, never had a nickname, and never cared for anyone. She didn't want Kaido to die and didn't want to revert to her old self. Kaido realized Maki had become more honest with herself and said, Maki Roll, you've realized your greatest enemy, haven't you? You used to think you didn't deserve friends, right? To love someone like me? You're better now, you can learn to love yourself. And Shuichi, never forget, you're not alone. You have friends, don't try to do everything by yourself, okay? Don't forget, the impossible is possible. All you gotta do is make it so. All right then, let's end this thing with a bang. A special punishment suited to the luminary of the stars. Well, screw you. I'm not gonna die the way you want. Monokuma is furious because Kaito escaped his punishment. Shuichi regains hope and is determined to expose the killing game once again. Monokuma asserts that the game will never end and uses a delayed effect flash black light on everyone. The chapter ends with a model resembling someone stating that as long as the killing game is fun, it will never end. This is a true despair. After the incident, the students are more united than ever and vow to uncover the truth together. Kibo, alone, declares he no longer hears any voices in his mind, upgrades his weapons, and destroys the entire Ultimate Academy for Gifted Juveniles, ending Chapter 5. Final Chapter Makoto appears, 
but he is just an ordinary, boring student who finds joy in watching something on his phone. Back at the academy, which Kibo is destroying, this is Kibo's only way to stop the game and expose the mastermind. Shuichi believes gathering more information is another way. Both decide to work simultaneously, while Monokuma is enraged by the destruction of his academy and business, and the Exosol robots battle Kibo. During his search, Shuichi finds Kokichi's lab, which contains only some children's costumes and a book on the history of Hope's Peak Academy that seems off from what they remember. Meeting Maki, both suddenly regain their memories from the delayed flash black light, giving them hope with Shuichi as a child encouraging them. Returning to Kokichi's room to investigate, they find he collected items from previous cases, wrote many plans and relationships to find the mastermind, and had many invention sketches, including some childish drawings to mislead. More importantly, Kokichi's motive video reveals he is not a remnant of despair, but the leader of the DIE organization, with 10 close members, aiming for harmless pranks. He even set rules against harming others, proving he hated the killing game from the start. It becomes clear that everything Kokichi showed on screen was a deception. He was a mischievous child forced into the killing game. He realized the game was created for the entertainment of despicable people who enjoy watching innocent lives being taken. Unable to cooperate with Shuichi or others, he had to create a persona as the main villain to make everyone believe he controlled the game and that it should end. He tried to save everyone by collecting all the motive videos to see who received their own motive video, helping the group identify who had the highest intent to commit a crime. He pointed out not to trust those around them too much, as Kade did, because there was a hidden mastermind. He persuaded Miu to create inventions to prove the game was a show and nearly achieved his goal. Kokichi is one of the most complex characters, and even after playing the game, you might not fully understand him. His existence is a perfect blend of lies and honesty. Shuichi asks Maki to find more inventions, is first word. Kokichi might have used while he follows Kokichi's next clue, a message left in the basement, where he finds the words Twins B and Horse A. They ask Kibo to break into Rontaro's lab, and as deduced, this is the password to unlock the secret door in Rontaro's lab. Inside, Shuichi found a USB containing a video of Rantaro leaving a message for himself in the next killing game. He mentioned that his memory would be erased and that his talent was the ultimate survivor. He also talked about the two final survivors who must participate in the next game and that he must win to expose the mastermind. After watching, Shuichi received another flashback light of hope, showing his classmates encouraging him. Then, Tsumugi called him to the cold sleep room, where she revealed that Kaide had a twin sister, just like Junko and Oshima. Both received another flashback light of hope, with the 16 students sending each other kind words before going into cold sleep. Back in the library, Maki completed her task by finding Kokichi's bug vacuum design. Despite its strong suction, she didn't find any bugs. Kibo then broke the secret room door, but Monokuma, seemingly summoned by the mastermind, tried to stop them. However, Kibo was too strong and handled everything, allowing the group to enter and find a giant Monokuma head. It claimed to be the creator of Monokuma, and the one who gave it its personality, stating that only the game manager could command it. Despite everyone's attempts to make it give birth to Monokuma, only Tsumugi's initial make birth command worked, but no one noticed. With no other evidence to investigate in the room, Shuichi found Rantaro's survivor perk, which included a map of the academy and notes on the best time to expose the mastermind when they needed to use the secret room in the library to control Monokuma. Additionally, the notebook had Rantaro's bloody handprint, different from the student handbook found at the first crime scene. Shuichi also found a bloodless iron ball with pink threads in the trash, realizing his mistake and feeling heartbroken. Outside, the battle between Kibo and Monokuma caused a landslide, sealing the secret room with Himiko still inside. With limited time before the battle's explosions destroyed the academy, Shuichi followed Kibo's advice and returned to the room where he first appeared. There, he found a modern table stuck in place. Using it, Shuichi realized it was a device to create flashback light memories, which could be customized, suggesting all previous flashback lights might have been fabricated. Suddenly, Himiko appeared in the classroom, causing the system to revert to a normal classroom, proving the mastermind was among them. More importantly, how did Himiko escape? She revealed the secret room had two doors, one leading to the tool room behind the girl's bathroom wall. Maki also found a photo confirming Rantaro's hand position in the library, giving Shuichi enough information to end the game. Shuichi then interrupted the battle between Kibo and Monokuma, demanding a class trial to end the killing game. Initially angry, Monokuma found Shuichi's actions interesting and agreed, threatening punishment if it was a trick. The students trusted Shuichi and agreed to the trial. Kibo also agreed, removing his combat gear and reattaching his ahogue to hear his inner voice again. Thanks to Kibo's ability to zoom in on nanoparticles, we discovered that inside the vacuum cleaner, there's a bear claiming to be a tiny Nanokuma holding a camera. Its job is to act as Monokuma's security camera, sending footage back to the bear and the mastermind. This makes Kokichi's decision to use a bomb that disables all electronic devices within a 100-meter radius seem incredibly smart. 
leaving Monokuma unsure about who the culprit and victim are among Maki, Kokichi, and Kaido. Back to the main event, Monokuma and the revived Monokubs arrive at the class trial, where Shuichi's goal is to reinvestigate the first case. Naturally, the Monokubs disagree since the decision has already been made. However, with new evidence proving that Monokuma's accusation of Kaide being the culprit is wrong, and the bear breaking the rules by not executing the students, things get interesting. Shuichi begins to prove his point, starting with the fact that Kaide's chances of successfully executing her plan were extremely low, almost impossible unless she was the ultimate lucky student like someone else. Secondly, Rantaro had two tablets, one that every student had, and the other, a survivor perk, which only he received as a reward. This tablet disappeared from the scene and was found in the mastermind's room, along with the iron ball containing pink fabric from Kade's backpack, which was found in the trash. So who is the culprit of the first case? None other than the mastermind. The motive was the time limit, which made the mastermind anxious since no murders had occurred. When Kade's plan failed, the mastermind took action. This raises numerous questions, such as whether the mastermind faked their death like in Hope's Peak Academy, or if Kade had a twin sister. Rejecting these absurdities, Shuichi questions everyone's alibis, Maki and Himiko have solid alibis, while Tsumugi was in the dining hall with Kirumi Tojo, and only left for a short bathroom break, which was none other than the women's restroom containing a secret door. Shuichi further points out that although the academy seemed to lack surveillance cameras, it actually had nano-sized bugs that could send information to Tsumugi. In the secret room, seeing Keide fail, Tsumugi opened it herself, and used another iron ball to kill Rantaro. Since the sensor camera had a 30-second delay, Tsumugi could easily do this without being caught. Additionally, the pink bear among the monocubs actively developed photos to inform the mastermind whether the culprit was revealed or not. Moreover, Monokuma's mother secretly told Shuichi that the keyword to create Monokuma is give birth, only usable when the mastermind says it. Sumugi, however, avoided this term and said make birth instead. Furthermore, when the group was in despair, after learning the truth about the outside world from Kokichi, it was Tsumugi who found a flashback light on the dining table, helping the group realize they were students of Hope's Peak Academy, fighting against the remnants of despair. This was fake. As we know the flashback light can fabricate any story about the Danganronpa world that the mastermind likes. This made Maki want to use her talent to kill Kokichi, even though she had no motive to do so before. It's more than enough to convince us that Sumugi, the ultimate cosplayer, is the culprit and mastermind of this killing game. Sumugi stops arguing, and as each monokub is gradually destroyed, she appears as Junko Enoshima the 53rd. With her ridiculous appearance and all the deception from day one, Shuichi and his friends refused to believe her. Initially, their memory was that Junko created the event alone, which is completely wrong since Mukuro and many other factors also helped Junko. Junko didn't lock up Class 68. The entire class locked themselves up due to the outside chaos, only because their memories were erased. Questions began to arise, such as why Rantaro participated in the previous killing game, despite his name not appearing in the historical records. This made Shuichi realize that he was merely being manipulated by Tsumugi and the memories implanted by the flashback light. Tsumugi was simply cosplaying previous Danganronpa characters because they weren't real. Just fictional stories within the Danganronpa V3 world. The 16 people here were real-world individuals whose memories, personalities, talents, and names were completely reset to fit a Danganronpa series story, with real people as the main actors. Essentially, everything from the beginning was a lie controlled by Tsumugi using her advanced fictional memory creation tools. She knew in advance that Himiko would bond with Tenko and Angie, that Shuichi would fall for Kaede, and that Maki would develop feelings for Kaito. Everything was adjusted to lead everyone to murder and hold class trials like in the fictional Danganronpa, serving millions of bored viewers in a peaceful world. Tsumugi was nothing more than a pawn in the grand scheme of the Danganronpa project. The only one who realized they were a character being watched from the outside world, like in a murderous version of The Truman Show, was the smartest and most cunning character in the series, Kokichi Oma. The game show wasn't called Danganronpa V3, but Danganronpa 53. When the Danganronpa team created 10 paper-based Danganronpa parts, they brought it to reality using real people, reaching the 53rd part, beloved by people worldwide. Shuichi shouldn't be confused because he was a fan who voluntarily signed up for this game. Kaede didn't even believe in humanity, and Kaido claimed he would kill everyone. Physically, Shuichi was one person, but mentally, he and his former self were different. He was just a fictional character given a personality and name to entertain despair-loving audiences. The group fell into despair, shedding tears, wondering how they could stop the killing game when the whole world wanted it. How could they find and overcome the lies and truths they were given? They were nothing but Danganronpa characters, leading to a bad ending. At that moment, an inner voice emerged. Kibo wanted to remedy the situation. He represented hope, which made Tsumugi laugh, saying that the audience was the inner voice inside Kibo. 
His hair was an antenna receiving outside world comments, and his eyes were cameras filming the entire game show. Tsumugi represented despair, while Kibo, now calling himself the ultimate hope robot, represented hope. They would battle as in every Danganronpa story, where hope and despair clash. Remember, the group didn't regain their original personalities or memories from the outside world. The game was designed for only two survivors. Kibo and Maki accepted sacrificing themselves to vote for Tsumugi, making her face punishment. For Shuichi, this game had gone too far. There was no joy in a game that turned people into entertainment and forced them to kill each other. Viewers might crave despair, but they also hoped that, in the end, hope would triumph over despair. They wanted the game to continue to witness that. The punishment here was no different from Tsumugi continuing as the mastermind for the next game, Kibo as the camera, and Maki as the ultimate survivor. Shuichi was tired of playing this game, which had killed so many of his friends. Even if his personality and memories were fake, the emotions he experienced were real and genuine to him. He didn't want those people to be satisfied just watching him overcome challenges. Only to realize that the entire story and game show they had just watched was fake, created by the Danganronpa writers. He decided to abandon any game, whether despair or hope wins, because he wasn't there to entertain anyone. He would use the entire story built on lies to turn it into reality and change the world. He told everyone to stop watching, and he would do nothing. At this point, the audience hacked Kibo's system. Kibo realized he might lose control and vote for Tsumugi, making hope win once again. But then Shuichi delivered a speech reaching the peak of fiction, which I call, Danganronpa, change the world. Shuichi shouted, our friends who died gave us their love, and we changed because of that. If we can inspire change in others, then that love will live on. That love will tear down the wall between fiction and reality, and it will live on forever. That's why I'm going to change the world. As long as I have their love, I will change it. Even if the whole story is a lie, I will use that lie to change the world. This moment was truly epic, defeating not just Kibo, but the audience as well. When it came time to vote, Sumugi believed she didn't need to vote because the audience controlling Kibo would vote for her, making hope win over despair once again. Just like Danganronpa had continued for 53 seasons. But no, the audience didn't vote, leaving all the votes blank. The audience had rejected the game show, and the world had changed after the story brought by Danganronpa's 53rd season, thanks to the relentless efforts of the student groups. Accepting defeat, Sumugi couldn't believe that her hard work over 53 seasons would end, and she accepted punishment along with Monokuma. Kibo destroyed the entire academy and this fake world with his own body. Maki, Shuichi, and Himiko were safe under the protective door. They looked out at the real world, believing they were the living proof of this ultimate fake and deceitful story. Shuichi believed that the audience wanted this lie to become the truth, and that Tsumugi was still lying about them voluntarily participating in the game. Although they couldn't determine what was true or false, Shuichi said, Yeah, but I feel like, there's not too much meaning in the true or lie. I mean that, even if something is a lie, even if fiction, if it has the power to change the world, then it must contain some kind of truth. Are we proof of that? In this fictional world, we overcame all these fictional struggles, but those things changed us, and we were able to change the world. So it doesn't matter where the truth ends and the lies begin. If lies can change the world as well as the truth can, then lies are just another way of telling the truth. Some lies lead the world to hope, and some truths lead the world to despair. So I can't really think someone would do something right in the end. Looking out at the world, they believed this was the best ending for the entire Danganronpa series, 